And if you will, once you get settled, grab your Bible, and if you'll make your way to the book of 1 Peter. We'll begin in 1 Peter this morning as we continue in this series as we are looking at what our game plan is as a church. As a church, we have a game plan. We have a game plan to see you worship. We have a game plan to see you grow in your faith. And we have a game plan to see going happen in your life. And so what we've done over the last couple of weeks is we've just looked at the first two aspects of our game plan. The first one being worship. And we talked about what it meant to worship God. We talked about what it meant to follow God. And we talked about what it looks like in your life and how you can sort of determine whether you are growing even in your worship or whether you're worshiping at all. And we made these two important statements. One, saved people worship. If you say you're a follower of Christ, what you are saying is that you worship the one true God. If you say that you follow Jesus and you're saved, then what you are saying is is that your life is now going to be conformed to his way of life. And you're going to follow his principles and precepts. You're going to follow all the teachings of Jesus. Why? Because you're a worshiper of God. Your behavior is going to change. The way you live your life is going to change. Even your gathering in this place is your being obedient to gather with the body of believers for the purpose of worshiping together, obeying his word by baptism and, and taking taking the Lord's Supper together, singing together, hearing his word together. This is what happens when we say we worship God. And then as we consider our worship, we know now that all of our life is meant for worship. That means everything about your life is placed at the feet of Christ to worship. You're giving him your money. You're giving him your marriage. You're giving him your children. You're giving him your response to sin and your response to the brokenness of this world. You're giving him your time and your calendar and your treasures and your talents. You're giving all of those to him for the purposes of saying, I worship you, therefore my life is a living sacrifice to you. That's worship. And then last week we talked about grow, and we talked about what it means to grow in your faith. And here's what we said. We said that growing people change. That if you are a follower of Jesus, you worship God, your life is going to change. That God never um, um, uh, gets into your life. God never uh, um, intercedes in between your sin and your destiny, and he never does that and then leaves you the same. Think about the Apostle Paul. What happened in the life of the Apostle Paul? He's on his road to Damascus. He's on a direction to persecute the church. What does Jesus do? Jesus shows up. And Jesus takes the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul at that time is breathing out threats against the church, and he's persecuting the church. He's actually on his way on the Damascus Road to take Christians prisoner and to see Christians persecuted. And then Jesus shows up, and he changes. That's true for Peter. Take all of the uh, disciples, and you'll see every single one of them changing. Why? Because growing people change. And then we said this, that growth is intentional, that you're not going to grow in your faith by accident, that you have to be intentional to grow in your faith. That means you have to remove things from your life. You have to uh, prepare your your days in such a way that you're going to be intentional to grow in your relationship with Jesus. And so today we're going to continue. We're going to look at the final aspect of our game plan. And as I was thinking about this, I, I, I remember recently, and I can't remember the, the, who, who I was having the conversation with or, or why. I think it was this summer maybe at a student camp, and I was asked a question about my high school days. And it was a specific question about, hey, do you, what are some things that happened in high school that, that impacted you personally? And I'll be honest, I really had a hard time trying to come up with like this one moment uh, in, in high school. But he, here's, what, here's what I did say. And as I was racking my brain to sort of think about, you know, what do I remember? remember, you know, about some of those days, what impacted me. And I can remember some fun things. I can remember maybe a a couple of, you know, football games or basketball games or baseball. I can remember some of those things, but what impacted me that I would even still today remember that impact? And here's what just popped in my head. I remember Christians. I remember standing in a gas station with a group of my friends, and there was a gas station sort of in the middle of our part of town, and that's where we would all meet up because one of our friends worked at that gas station, and we may or may not have gotten free food from a time to time. So we would gather at that gas station. I remember standing with a group of friends, and I can remember this like it was yesterday. I don't remember the guy's name. I know he went to school with us. 
But I remember seeing him walk towards a, a, a large group of his classmates. And I can even remember today seeing on his face even a sense of, uh, of just sort of nervousness. And so he walks up to us, and I'll never forget, he begins to share the gospel with us. He just sees us and says, you know what, I'm going to go do what I'm supposed to do. So he walks over to us, and he starts asking us questions. And, of course, at that time in my life, I was raised by parents who were believers. And, of course, I, no doubt at that point, I was lost as a goose. But in that mind, I, in that night, I, I was, I, no, I'm a believer, yeah, because I go to church every day. I do this, you know, every week, not every day. That would have been awesome. My parents would have bought me a car as soon as I turned 15. But anyway, but I remember him. I remember um, I'm walking through the hallways, and, I, and I'll never forget uh, another uh, student who was, a, who was a believer, and I could see this person sharing the gospel with another person. I remember Christians. I remember being invited to church by some friends. I, I remember sitting and listening in a student ministry service, a, 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 the student guy who I still to this day have a relationship with. I remember even the message that he talked about that night. I remember one of his illustrations was the song, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For by You Too. I remember that. I remember Christians. Why? Because the most impactful thing you will ever do in a person's life is tell them about Jesus. The most important thing you will ever say to a person is the truth of the gospel. I remember those things because they are meant to have lasting impact. And so today, we're going to take a few moments, and we're going to talk about the last part of our game plan, and that's we make disciples who worship, grow, and go. Let's say that together. We make disciples who worship, grow, and go. And we've taken these three concepts of worshiping and growing and going, and we've put them in sort of a, a three circles sort of um, um, a template here. And so you'll see this on the screen, the different circles that sort of identify what we do um, as, as worshipers of God, as growers in our faith. And we see going where we train, where we share the gospel, where we participate, where there's advocacy. And we'll get to some of those things in details later on. But this is what we do as believers. We worship, we grow, and we go. We are on mission. Now, I don't know if you know this about Grand Avenue. You might be new to the church or newer to the church, but one of the, one of the blessings of this church, as a matter of fact, 10 years ago when we were being interviewed by this church, I, I remember asking the search committee, the group of people that were trying to determine whether or not they felt that we were the ones to present to the church our family to come and for me to pastor and for us to live here and to serve you. I'll never forget one of the questions I asked them was, what are some of the things that, about Grand that if I were to come to the church and change, that I I would lose my job pretty quickly. What are those things? And they named a couple of things, but you know, one of the things that they said, missions. Don't change us from being a missions-minded church. And so I had the incredible blessing of walking into a church that was already pushing go, already on mission, already um, uh, putting in front of, of you and putting in front of even me at the time opportunities for me to go. And when you think about it, you think about missions in general, the reason we have go sort of at the end of this sequence is because when you worship God, when you grow in your faith, it will lead you to go. Listen to this. Missions is the ultimate expression of our identity and purpose as Christians. That when you are on mission, it is the ultimate expression that you worship God. It is the ultimate expression that you are growing in your faith because when you worship, when you grow, you will go. And Peter's going to help us unpack this truth. Because what Peter's going to say is, is, listen, you've been called into something. There's some sort of descriptive things about you in the Bible. These, these words that, that you are now identified as. And because you are these things, they're going to move you to, to go. They're going to move you to, to, to tell people about Jesus. They're going to move you to go. They're going to move you to care about the lost world. Why? Because as you continually remember that what happened on the cross was supernatural for you, that your salvation is supernatural. Think about that for a second. Think about the very fact that before you were a follower of Jesus, think about your life. And some of you can start even now and start going, man, I, I just cannot believe that I am saved. 
I cannot believe that God would save me. And when you think about your very salvation, you think about where you were when God saved you, here's what happened. Something supernatural happened. Because I don't know if this is true about you, but it's definitely true about me. The only reason Brad Luter is saved is something supernatural happened. I was very far from God. Oh, I was close to him in my mind just because of how I was raised and my parents did their job. I was close to him here, but very far from him here. And I get overwhelmed at times when I think about how God saved me. Listen, you did not save yourself. You did not save yourself. If you saved yourself, well, then you get to boast. You, you get to say that, that you're a follower of Jesus because of something you did. No, you are a follower of Jesus because of something God did. God is, not, is awesome. You are not awesome. Do you get that? God is the one who is awesome. And so that causes us to, to humble ourselves, to be reminded of this supernatural exchange that took place in our life. The very fact that the Savior of the world, the creator of the universe, would reach down and save me is a supernatural thing. What was supernatural about the cross? Jesus took on your sins and my sins. He paid the price that we were meant to pay. He died the death that we were supposed to die. For what purpose? For the forgiveness of our sins. Amen? It's incredible overwhelming exchange that takes place when you, you're saved. And, and Peter in chapter 2, you can make your way to chapter 2, First Peter's going to teach us about this sort of exchange that takes place. Now that you're a follower of Jesus, now that you are a worshiper of God, now that you are growing in your faith, well, what does that say about you? How are you identified as now? What are these words that describe who you are? And in, in seeing that, what does it move you to do? Here's what 1 Peter 2, starting in verse 9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's unpack some of these descriptions of who you are. When you are a follower of Jesus, when you are saved, look at verse 9 again. He says, you are a chosen race. Now, there's clearly a corporate component to this. He's talking to the true Israel. He's talking to the, the church, but it's very individual. Listen, you are a chosen race. You are a part of a chosen race. You are a part of a people that are identified not by their physical race, but what draws you together is the very fact that you are the people of God, whether you're white, whether you're black, whatever your background is, wherever you come from, your, your hair color, your gender. At the end of the day, what brings the church together as one is Jesus and Jesus alone. That's why he says you are a chosen race, the true Israel, the church. You have been chosen as a people which is why we see in the scriptures that we are to live as aliens and strangers in this world. That this is not our home. We identify, what, as a chosen race of people. What makes us a chosen race of people? The fact that God has saved us. And so what gives us our identity now as followers of Jesus is not our color, it's not our culture, but the fact that we have been chosen. It's our chosenness that makes us a holy chosen race of people. And so as Christians, what do we do? What are we caught up into? We're caught up into this reality that what makes me me now is not what the world says, but what Jesus says about me. What changes my behavior and what causes me to choose one thing over another is the very fact that I'm a part of this chosen race of worshipers of God who are growing in their faith, who have a mission and a task to go to this world and to tell people about Jesus. And so who, who am I? Well, I'm chosen. God, God chose me. 
And I submitted to his calling on my life to be saved. And when I do that, I proclaim my worship of him. I make a commitment to grow in my faith. And that moves me to do something. It moves me to go out into this world and to tell other people as to how they can be chosen too. And so I didn't earn my salvation. You didn't earn your salvation. God gave it to you. It's called grace. It's called mercy. As a matter of fact, he he deals with this in verse 10. Go to the next verse. He said, you had not received what? Mercy. But now you have received what? Mercy. Listen for a second. Aren't you glad that our God is a merciful God? Now listen, my goal this morning is for us to just be overwhelmed and excited and humbled about the very fact that God has saved you. Mercy. He's given us mercy. We did not deserve the salvation that we have. We don't deserve to be called a chosen race. But God, because of his love for us, while we were still sinners, he died for us. And he gave us a way to be right with him right now through the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know where you would be without mercy? You'd be on the path to hell. But because God and his love and his grace, he gave us something we didn't deserve. It's called mercy. And so because of that, all that I am is shaped by that truth. All that I am is shaped by the very fact that God has given me mercy. The direction of my life is changed by that truth. The action of my life is motivated by this truth that he has given me mercy. Now, in the same breath, lest you think Christianity is about you being perfect, lest you think Christianity is about you always doing the right thing, mercy is for those who need it. How many of you need mercy today? Yeah, I need mercy. And so when we sin, when we sit, we live in a broken world, we still have our flesh. I mean, if you read, uh, you know, uh, read the life of the Apostle Paul or Peter, see their flesh show up on occasion, see them war and battle their flesh. That's why I believe in the New Testament, Christianity is called work, it's called toil, it's, it's a liken to a race. There's endurance involved, that being a Christian means that you are now in a war. And your war is against your flesh, and your war is against a real demonic presence that wants to distract and derail and destroy any movement towards Jesus. And so we're in a battle. And as we're in that battle, we do mess up from time to time. You know why? Because we're messed up. As a matter of fact, we haven't done this in a while, and it's a great Sunday because we had a cold front come through. It's 92 Let me just sort of burst your bubble a little bit. Look at the person next to you and just say it. You are messed up. Go ahead and do that. (laughs) Wives, I'm giving you a chance once again. You're welcome. And so here's what I'm saying. When you think about mercy, what mercy has done for us is it's, it's given us a way to pursue a holy God, to be right with him right now as we navigate the realities of living in a broken world under the curse of sin. As believers in grace, God gives us mercy. So because I've been acted upon first, because God has has intervened into my life, my life now acts accordingly. This is what we talked about last week as we say, you know, live your life in in a manner worthy of the calling that you have received. Live your life in such a way that mercy really has found you. Yes, even your response to your own sin, as you repent, as you call it out, as you're convicted of it, as it bothers you, as it, as, it, as it frustrates you. Yes, even in those moments, live your life in such a way that mercy has found you. Listen, you are saved because God saved you. 
And so because God saved us, the verse is going to continue in verse 9 by explaining that, that we are this, this chosen race. We are a group of people that have received mercy. What makes us this chosen race is the mercy of God. And so because of that, listen, here's who we are. We are God's possession. This is expressed twice in verse 9. Go back to the text. You are a people of God's own possession. Verse 10, you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Your life doesn't belong to you anymore. We had an opportunity this morning, awesome, to, to again, one of the main reasons we gather as a body of believers is we, we take the Lord's Supper together. We, we, we see baptisms together, and we believe baptism should happen in the church in front of God's people. But look what happens in the, the symbolic expression in baptism. As you're standing above that water, listen, this signifies your life. This signifies the time in your life where you're really dead. And then when we say we baptize you in the name of who? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one true triune God. We're not baptizing you in you. We're not baptizing you in your parents' faith. We're not baptizing you because you are, you've made these sort of decisions. You made all the right things happen in your life, and so now you're ready to sort of be saved. No, we're doing this because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has showed up in your life and has given you mercy. And so when we baptize you, what do we do? We take you under the water, buried with Christ. This signifies a death. But now you are raised to do what? To walk the same life. To keep doing the same thing. No, no, what do we say? You're buried with Christ and you're raised to walk in a new way of life. As a follower of Jesus, at this point, that new way of life is God's way of life for you. Why? Because you are his. You are his possession. I am his possession. And so because I am his possession, my life now is dictated and directed by what God wants for me. Think about the decisions you've made in your life that you would have not made that particular decision had you not been a believer, had you not been a Christian. You know, there are several things in my life that probably would not have happened today if I were not a believer. I'm probably not married to my wife today if I'm not a believer. I'm certainly not living in Arkansas if I'm not a believer. It took me a while to get used to wearing shoes. I'm from Louisiana. It's a weird thing. But think about those things in your life, those decisions that you've made that you would have not made had you not been a follower of Jesus. We make those decisions for what purpose? Because we are his. We exist for God. So you are God's possession. Verse 9 again, you are a holy nation. You are a part of a chosen race. You are God's people. You've been given mercy. You are a holy nation. This idea that you've been set apart, this idea that you, you're different, this idea that, that you have a different way of living than the rest of the world, again, not in an arrogant way, but because you've been given mercy. Mercy changes you, and that mercy came from God. And God says, you're a holy nation. You're a people that are that have set apart. Christ is, is in you, and, and he allows you to fulfill his mission on this side of heaven. Listen, without the burden of sin. And we now know that our salvation is based on exactly what God has done, given us Jesus. It's not our works, but it's his works. We can be a holy nation, yes, even right now. You are right with God right now. For some of you, that's, you get, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. But for some of you, you've had a, a difficult week. You've made some choices this week. Or maybe there's some things going on in your life right now. You're like, how in the world could I be right with God right now? When I say right with God right now, I mean your salvation. You are saved. You may need to repent of some sin. You may need to definitely uh, deal with the consequences of your choices. But as it pertains to your salvation, nothing can ever separate you from the love of God. But as Christians, when we sin, we have a way. We repent. We're convicted of it. And then we continue to press on 
Why? Because we've been given mercy. We weren't just given mercy one time. We're given mercy all the time. Some of you were given mercy on the way to church today. Some of you are give, you, you, you're getting mercy right now because in your head you're like, is he ever going to finish? We get, I've been given mercy so many times. It's, I am so, so thankful for it, aren't you? We're a holy nation. So we get to live our life without this, this burden over us where we're trying to earn our way. And so when we sin, uh, we let sin lie to us and tell us we're not saved. Don't let sin lie to you and tell you you're not saved. You, you remember what saved you in the first place. Not your works, but Jesus' works. I, I was uh, reminded of this as I was writing this. I, I went out into my backyard. Um, actually, I was in my garage uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I was in my garage. I lifted the garage up, and I was looking in the corner of the garage, and I noticed an unusual amount of spider webbing. And I was like, oh, man, there's probably, you know, a little spider over there. And as I started to pick at the spider web, um, a, a big black widow came out, scared me to death. I jumped back. I was like, oh, my goodness. I mean, I was, I was thinking, like, do I shoot it? Do I? I mean, when you see a black widow, I mean, like for me, and maybe you're not a, but for me, if I see a black, I'm thinking, man, how in the world am I going to get this? And I was like, all right, Lola's got small hands. Lola, get over here. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I mean, it took me a minute. And you know what I did is I found a, uh, a, a broken off what used to be, a, I think, a rake. And the rake was gone. We still had the, the stick. And, man, I killed that thing like I was killing, you know, the biggest, baddest thing in the world. I mean, I was just hitting. I was making sure it was dead. And I was, you know, I know this is graphic, but I got a point. And something hit me. I thought, man, how silly did I look? I mean, if there were a camera on me in that garage, you see this guy, you know, and I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a small guy. I'm here, I'm, here I am 6'2", you know, 220-ish. We'll talk about that later. But I'm a lot bigger than that spider. And listen, I'm not unaware that a black widow bite is going to hurt and it's going to cause some problems. I'm not unaware of that. But I also know now, and I'll tell you why I know this now, I know now that really all I had to do was just step on the thing. I mean, put my shoes on first, but just step on the thing. I mean, it's not going to jump at me. It's not gonna, it, it doesn't know jujitsu. It's, it's, a, it's a little spider. Yes, it's got some danger to it, but I'm 6'2", 220-ish. It's this big. Just step on it. So I go in my backyard. There's a point to this, I promise. I go in my backyard, and um, we've got this, um, one of those, you know, pools that you put up and take down, you know, a little above ground little pool, and you put up and you take it down. So I go outside, and, and I notice there's some, you know, grass around it. I need to weed it around it to get some stuff squared away. And, and as I'm moving some stuff, uh, I see another black widow. This time, I'm like, what's up? Step on it. I move around the pool again. I see another black widow. Step on it. Listen, I, I know we got a yard problem, by the way. I did that five times. There were five black widows at some point around my pool, and not one time did I scream, not one time did I react. I just stepped on the black widow. Why? Because I'm not letting the black widows lie to me anymore. I am bigger, I am stronger, I am faster, and, man, I am good enough. Amen? <laughs> Don't let sin lie to you. Let sin convict you. Respond to your sin the way the Bible tells us to. Repent of it, call it out, and keep pressing on. Why? Because you are God's possession now, and nothing can remove you from it. You are a chosen race. You have received mercy. You are his. You are a royal priesthood, in verse 9. You're a holy nation set apart. You're a royal priesthood. Think about that for a second. A royal priesthood, you now are in the presence of God. You do not need a mediator between you and God. You don't need a high priest to go before you to atone for your sins through some sacrifice that you offer. No, you are in the presence of God. And your life, because of that, your life is to be lived in priestly service. 
going to God, offering your life as a living sacrifice, following Jesus where you live, work, and play. Worship him, grow in him, and go in him. All of your life is meant for this. You are now a worshiper of God. And so because of that, you are a part of his mission and his plan. And if you were to step out of that mission, if you were to step out of that plan, if your life is no longer offered as a living sacrifice, well, then it's out of character of someone who worships God, of someone who grows, of someone who wants to go. We see this in Romans chapter 12 in the first two verses. Our identity in God is that we're his. We're chosen. We're a holy Nation. We're a royal priesthood. For what purpose? I mean, that's who you are if you're a follower of Christ. And listen, by the way, that's really good news. Do, if you agree with that being good news, just say amen. Just let me know you're awake. Amen. There we go. It's really good news. And so if that's who we are, then for what sake? What's the end game here? Okay, I'm his possession. I'm a, I'm, I'm a chosen nation. I'm a holy nation. I'm a royal priesthood. I mean, I see all of that. That's awesome. I've, I've been given mercy. Why does God do all of that? Let me give you a principle that I've said over the years that I want to remind you in. God never does anything just for you. God has blessed you with mercy. God has blessed you with grace. He's blessed you with your very salvation. Why? Because he loves you and he wants to bless you. And he's given us the very first and most important blessing we'll ever get. If God never does anything else for you, he has saved you. But God never blesses us just for us. And so if I've been blessed with mercy, I've been blessed with being called into this chosen race, I've been blessed to be a part of this holy nation, I've been blessed to be a part of this royal priesthood, what is the reason why? What's the purpose? If it's not just for me, then what's it for? Go to the rest of verse 9. That you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He did this so that you would proclaim him. He did this so that you would praise him in such a way that others would see it. That your priesthood part of this is to proclaim the Lord Jesus as Savior. Here's what that means as we think about our game plan go, the part of our game plan go. Here's what that means for you. Here's what that means for me, that our full-time job, it's to take our life, lay it on the altar, let everything about our life be meant for his glory, for our good, so that we could leverage everything in our life to proclaim the truth of Jesus. That means for you, that means for me, that means for everyone, we are all missionaries. Everyone is a missionary. And here's what we've done. We've taken this concept of being a missionary, and we only apply it to those who are overseas, those who go to another country to learn a different language. There are missionaries, and yes, they are. And they've been called to a specific place. But did you know that you're in a place too? Did you know that you're in a place right now where there are lots of people that don't know Jesus? And we can't sit around and sort of wait for someone to be called here You've been called here. Why? Because you're here. It's why we talk about all the time where we live, work, and play. God has placed you in the home for that very purpose, to leverage it as a missionary, to point people to Jesus. Your marriage is meant to leverage it, to point people to Jesus. Why? You're a missionary. Everything in your life is meant to be leveraged towards pointing people to Jesus. And so God has a mission for all believers Every believer, when you say you are saved and you worship God, you say you're growing in your faith, you cannot get away as you worship and as you grow from the reality that God has a mission for you. Listen to what he said to the disciples as he asked them to follow him. Matthew chapter 4, verse 19 says this, Follow me, he told them, and I will make you fish for people. When you follow Jesus, people become your 
aim. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Acts chapter 1, 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We're all missionaries. We're all caught up into this mission to tell people about Jesus. And every part of our life is meant to be leveraged towards that end. And that's the point of the text. The goal is that we make disciples. And making a disciple is telling someone about Jesus. A disciple is someone who worship, grows, and goes. And we make disciples by telling people how to be right with God. By, by telling people that God has given an invitation to you to follow him. And if you follow him, he's going to turn you into a person who goes after people in one way or another. And so as a church, it's extremely important that we consider our game plan. That we, it's extremely important that we consider that our desire together is that we worship him together. Our desire is that we grow together for the purpose of going Listen to what Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15 says as I close out. How then can they call on him that they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. God has called me to be the pastor of Grand Avenue. I believe that with my whole heart. And so far, you seem to believe it too. But he's not just called me here to proclaim the good news. He's called all of us to proclaim the good news. Through our lives, through our talents, through our giftings, where we live and where we work and where we, we play. And so what do we do with this as we consider go? What do we do with this? Three very quick things. Or excuse me. Well, we'll go three. Number one, live on mission. Live on mission. Um, in your chair or a chair around you, you'll notice a, a white band. Did you get one of those white bands? If you did, just throw your hand in there and wave it like you, you care. Okay. What does that band say? It says, say something. Many years ago, we introduced this idea of saying something. And I want to just reintroduce it to you. And we want to give you this bracelet to remind you that wherever you go, and you have every opportunity, so many opportunities to say something to somebody. Well, what do you say to somebody? Well, anything that's wrapped in spirituality is really important. But specifically, we want you to share the gospel with people. We're going to take opportunities when, when you have it to say something. And the most important thing worth saying is to tell someone about Jesus, to take every opportunity you can to point people to Christ by telling them about salvation. There's so many different ways that you can do that, and we want to train you to do that. As a matter of fact, uh, September next Sunday, we have a Say Something training. You can sign up for that Say Something training. You can come up here on Sunday, and we'll take a few minutes, a little bit of time just to go over this. But one of the things we want to share with you, and some of you have already seen it, is a really simple way to point people to Jesus as you have the opportunity, and it's called the three circles. There's a, there's a plan, there's a process called the three circles. And this three-circle process is a process that sort of points to how you can just tell someone about Jesus. And in this process, and I'll go over it very quickly, I think we have another video somewhere, or maybe uh, I think maybe Hunter did a video explaining it a little bit more. But here's the reality. You take these three circles, and you can just draw them out, and you can see the one that's called brokenness. We live in a broken world, do we not? And it doesn't take long to notice it. As a matter of fact, I don't know very many people, if there are any people, that would ever deny the fact that we live in a broken world. Why is it broken? It's broken because God has a design and the design was not meant to be broken. It wasn't meant to have this kind of brokenness in it. Well, what broke it? Sin broke it. And so because of that brokenness, people try to uh, fix the brokenness by all kinds of things. They try to fix it through substances, through relationships. I mean, you pick your poison through work. I mean, they try to be a good person. They try to fix that brokenness. But here's what God did. God gave us a way 
to be right with him, to fix that brokenness, and it's called the gospel. And when you come encounter with the gospel, when you know the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, the way you take a step away from that brokenness is to repent and to believe. And when you repent and when you believe in the gospel, you recover and then you pursue. You are now a disciple who worship, grows, and goes. It's a quick way. There's a lot more to it to that, but it is a quick way to share the gospel. And we want to give you those tools And we want to encourage you to learn these things. We want to encourage you to to get to a point where you say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to to describe all of this. Let Let me get someone else. Okay, we want to give you ways that you can get away from that, where you know that in that moment you can draw those circles out and you can point someone to Jesus. We want you to say something. We want you to live on mission. Number two, we want you to go on mission. October 22nd will be our go day. Mark your calendars. That's the day where you come here. We talk about go. We, we go over to the gym. We have all of our mission partners there. We give you opportunities to sign up and to pray about what mission trip are you going to go on. If you are able, if you can, you should go. And you should consider even now, where are you going to go next year to go on mission? And the last one is this, that you are to give toward the mission. When you give your resources, when you obey God by tithing, when you obey God by being obedient to to his calling, as you say, I need to give to that, you you give to it. Because when you give to the church, no dollar goes unused. And behind every gift, there is an effort to change lives. Matter of fact, in a few weeks, we're going to talk about something really important as it pertains to the mission of our church. And it's going to require some sacrifice and some faith from all of us to, to believe in that mission. To, why? Because we recognize that we have a purpose in our city, in our region, and that's to point as many people to Jesus as we can. And God has blessed our church with a heart to go. And my challenge to you this morning is simple. My challenge to you this morning is, is if you're not going, why not? My challenge to you this morning is to consider your life where you live, work, and play. Consider the blessing that God has given you and your family and your resources, your time, your talents. How are you leveraging your life for the sake of the gospel? I hope this morning that you're encouraged by the fact that you've been given mercy and that you're reminded today of the gift that is the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Why in the world will we not want to tell people about that? Why would we not want to show people how they can receive mercy from God and be right with him? And so I pray that you're challenged by that. I pray this morning, listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you're hearing all this about God saving you and chosen and a priesthood, I mean, surely that's going to provoke questions for you. If you're not a follower of Jesus this morning and you would like to talk to someone about what it means to follow Jesus and, and maybe get a little bit more detail on some of the things that we're talking about, or maybe you have some specific questions, or maybe today you're just ready to put your faith and trust in Jesus. You've heard enough. The Holy Spirit is calling you, and you want to be saved today. And so if that's you this morning, if you have questions or you're ready to put your faith and trust in Jesus, I want to encourage you to do one of two things. You can take that Red Connect with us card. You can fill it, on, fill it out right on the back. You need a pastor to call me. I'll call you. One of our staff members, one of our ministers will call you. We'll set up a time and we'll talk to you. We'll answer whatever questions you have and we'll help you try to make the most important decision you'll ever make and that's what you believe about Jesus. But you don't have to do it that way. You can talk to someone today. In just a second, I'm going to pray. We're going to stand. We're going to respond in worship. Um, Allie will come up, give us some parting words. You'll be dismissed to go in your community group. If you want to talk to someone today about putting your faith and trust in Jesus. I'll be standing down front when the service is over. You come down, you see me. We'll take all the time that we need. We'll answer all the questions that you have and, 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 and we'll pray that you will put your faith and trust in Jesus today. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you. We do thank you. And God, I pray today as we're reminded about our game plan that we'll be challenged to consider our own worship of you, where we're lacking in our growing in you. And God, be challenged to go. And God, I know the go part's the toughest thing for people. But God, I pray today, because we are reminded of what you've done, the only, the only response that gives the same weight to the mercy that we've been given 
is a, res- is a response of going. And so God challenge us all today to consider that, to remove any excuses we have as to why we don't go or why we don't give towards going. But God, today will be the day that we make a commitment, that we're going to be a part of this. We're going to leverage our lives towards the advancement of the gospel. We're going to make sacrifices, and we're going to go on trips when we can. And we're going to give towards the mission. And so, God, I pray that today, my prayer, Lord, is that this is a, this is a mission season and a year that, God, will see more people from Grand going on mission than we've ever seen before. Why? Because we've received mercy And you've called us to do it. And our response as we worship, our response as we grow, is that we go. So, Father, I pray today for believers as we're challenged, as we're encouraged, as we're reminded of your life, your death, your burial, your resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, I pray it gives us joy. I pray it gives us peace. And that we're reminded of the very hope that we have every single day. And that's a life in Christ. And I pray today for those that have never put their faith and trust in you. They won't leave here today without doing that. God, we love you, we thank you, we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?